thank uh, the Houston ISDC for inviting me here to talk with you uh, at this luncheon here. Um, it's scheduled to end at 1.30, but I'm going to have to go a little longer than that because it started uh, late. Um, so everything else will just move back 20 minutes. Uh, uh, what I'm here to talk about is humans to Mars. How I think we can get humans to Mars within a decade. Either a decade from now or a decade from whenever anybody turns on the money, but I prefer a decade from now. <laughs> It is neat that we should be discussing this here and now, okay? Uh, we are right now in the sort of the opening wind-up phase of the 2000 presidential campaign. Uh, the various camps are now being formed around the different major contenders, okay? Uh, it is very, very, very important that we seize the opportunity of the coming year to penetrate these political camps, all of them, because it is impossible to know at this point which one will emerge on top. Okay? Um, yeah, so if you're a liberal Democrat, speak to Gore's people. If you're a conservative Republican, speak to Mr. Bush or Mr. McCain or whoever. Okay, but we need to reach all these people because okay, the best chance that we are going to have to get a Humans to Mars program launched in the coming period, perhaps in our lifetimes, will occur in 2001. Okay, in the first year of the first term of the first American administration of the next millennium. Okay, provided that we are not at war, which is not completely certain at this point, but nevertheless, uh, I uh, do believe that one way or another we this current situation will not persist that long. Uh, provided we are not at war, and provided that the current general economic situation remains in place of incredible prosperity, we have a situation right now where you have a superpower with no significant worldwide credible military opposition with an economy three times, almost four times what it was in 1961 when Kennedy launched us to the moon. Okay, a great people, a great nation with nothing to do. Okay, okay. it's going to be an incredible time for new beginnings. It's, it's going to be a situation where no nation ever has had a better opportunity to launch a great age of exploration and a great age of human history as the United States will at this juncture. The only parallel I, I can think of is, is Britain right after their defeat of the Spanish Armada and related events when all of a sudden the world was open to them, but for us it's even vastly more so because we are an incredible nation and there are many other nations who think like us that are willing to join with us in this sort of endeavor. So it's going to be a unique opportunity and uh, we must seize the time. We must. Okay? Uh, it is for that reason, of course, that we found the Mars Society up in Boulder last summer. We're going to have another convention there this summer. I invite you to come in August in Boulder. But whether you want to join the Mars Society or not, uh, the National Space, whether as a National Space Society member or chapter or just as an individual, okay, I invite you to join in, in helping us make this a reality. Now, a few technical points. Okay, you. Okay, look. Humans to Mars is the task for our age. Okay? There are some people who view this as something for the far future. That's fuck. Okay? We are much better today to send humans to Mars than we were to send people to the moon in 1961 when Kennedy started the moon program. We are much better prepared. And how can that be? Okay? Some people, okay, those who uh, view the Humans to Mars program as an episode for the future. Look at things that they've seen like this from the uh, NASA 1980 report. Giant interplanetary spaceships, okay, need to be built according to the, such documents. Uh, assembled in orbit on floating interplanetary spaceports. Ships weighing thousands of tons. 
requiring for their assembly, orbit, hangars, construction docks, hydrogen, fuel depots, power generation stations, you know, an entire parallel universe. Uh, okay. uh, which is where, you know, some people say it's going to cost hundreds of billions of dollars to take 30 years before you can do this. Well, it would take hundreds of billions of dollars to take 30 years in order to do that. But that is not what is necessary to send humans to Mars. Okay? The, these sorts of, 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 of plans that you may have seen on the giant spaceships and so forth, the reason why they're all so gigantic is because they are shipping to Mars and back all the fuel, oxygen, and other consumables that is needed for the round trip. And there's a major fallacy there. Okay? That is not the way we have explored on Earth. If we had attempted to explore on Earth that way, the exploration of the Earth would have been impossible. Okay. Lewis and Clark cross America with 25 men, 26 men. Uh, the hunting their way across doesn't appear to be a major logistics effort. But imagine what would have happened if they had tried to bring with them all the food, water, and air for themselves and their horses. They would have needed thousands of wagons to carry all, and all of those wagoneers and their horses would have needed thousands more wagons each. It would have created a project that would have blown the budget of Thomas Jefferson's America. Possibly of our America. Um, the, uh, but instead, they used the local resources. They made it look easy. Mars, Mars is a planet. Okay, It's a planet that has on it all the resources needed to support life and civilization. That's why it's interesting to us. And it's precisely the same resources that make Mars interesting that make it attainable. <coughs> So how do you do that? Okay. Well, we don't need Battlestar Galactic spaceships and parallel universes okay, to send people to Mars. We do need a heavy lift launch vehicle. Okay. Now, uh, there's a lot of uh, interesting advanced concepts for advanced reusable launch vehicles out there. I wish them all well. But the fact of the matter is, is we do not need anything more advanced than things we know very well how to build in order to send humans to Mars. Okay? We could use a Saturn V. Okay? Or we could use uh, shuttle-derived heavy lift launch vehicles like this one that we designed in Martin Marietta when I was there, uh, called Naris, which is a um, shuttle external tank with a couple of um, solid rocket boosters there and you know four shuttle main engines. And as I pointed out um, to people on, on previous talks, those engines are available. They're lying around in crates near the Rockettine factory if you can go to Park, California. And in fact, they're available for free if you go at night. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the night watchman has been laid off. The earthquake has taken down the fence. Just it's not. <laughs> and then you need uh, an upper stage and a hydrogen oxygen upper stage that so you know very well how to do will work. Uh, and uh, this booster, a booster of this character, could be launched off the shuttle pads. That's why it has the engines offset thus, so it reduces the shuttle uh, launch pads, which have their flame trenches positioned. So if you were willing to rebuild the, uh, the pads, you could just put the engines under it, and you get a higher performance. But anyway, this is not rocket science. Um, <laughs> um, and a, a, a booster of this type. Okay, could launch 120 tons to LEO. That's a little less than Saturn V, which should do 140. A little more than the Energy, which should do 100. Uh, it's in that general class. Okay, but it could also send 47 tons on a direct trajectory to Mars, or 59 uh, to the Moon. And that's how we want to do the mission. Just lift and throw and let it go. Send the payload to the planet using the same upper stage and the same booster that lifted it to LEO in the first place. Just get the Battlestar Galactic out of your vision here, okay? And that, just doing the mission that way, will take the mission out of the parallel universe of the orbiting space forks and put it in our universe of brass tax engineering. But how, okay? Gee, okay, 120 tons to Leo is pretty good. It's five, uh, six times what the shuttle can launch. But it's way below, you know, this Battlestar Galactic here that weighs 1,000 tons. Well, <laughs> How, how do you do the mission then? Well, clearly, you can divide the mission up into multiple throws, 
1,000 by 120 is eight. Conceivably, one could launch to Mars. Eight chunks have all flown out to Mars in convoy or on the move along the way or in Mars or on the Martian surface or someplace and put the mission together. But that's not a good way to fly the mission because if you got eight launches and one goes to the drink, you lose the whole mission. Okay, so that, that, that's not really appropriate. I'm willing to bank on two launches both working, but if we did the mission that way, that would still leave us at 500 tons a shot, which is much too much for a practical launch vehicle. Well, what's the alternative? Well, one could invoke advanced propulsion. Okay, there's a lot of things out there that is better than chemical rockets. Nuclear propulsion, for example. Ion drives. Fusion propulsion. Anyone for antimatter? <laughs> about warp drive? <laughs> Teleportation? <laughs> Pixie dust? <laughs> No, oh, in all seriousness, a lot of this stuff will work someday. For example, pixie dust. Uh, no, excuse me. Uh, uh, <laughs> nuclear thermal rockets can certainly be made to work. We fired one test dance in this country in the 1960s. High energy ion drives can be made to work once we get very large space nuclear reactors, which there's no problem in principle for, okay, except it is a major technological development. Even fusion uh, engines will sometime, someday work. I'm convinced of that. And in fact, they will be very important for the colonization of Mars and for the opening up of the deep solar system and possibly into stellar space. But not within 10 years. And what's all this about 10 years? Why is it essential that we get to Mars within 10 years of program start? The reason why it's essential that we get to Mars within 10 years of program start is because a humans to Mars program is an embattled entity. Anything like a humans to Mars program is an embattled entity. It, it's in a, a tactical situation, and there's people attacking it, okay? And in fact, if I was to use a military analogy to the situation facing anything like the U.S. to Mars program supported by the U.S. government, um, the best analogy I can think of is the military situation faced by the children of Israel in attempting to cross the Red Sea, as depicted in the book of Exodus. Okay? In other words, here's the situation. You want to get to the Promised Land, right? But you can't do it. The Red Sea is in front of you. You're going to die, and the Egyptians are coming up. Okay, but then a miracle happens. Moses parts the water. To Bush gives a speech. Okay, so now. <laughs> Mars. Okay. 
Well, the payload consists of a number of things. The primary object is an Earth return vehicle, or ERV. Now, what the Earth return vehicle is, it's a little rocket ship. Okay? It's got a little cabin. Okay, uh, it's, uh, it's 15 feet diameter and 16 feet tall, so it's got two decks each with 18 headroom. It's basically got Spartan quarters for a crew of four to do a six month voyage from Mars back to Earth uh, during the final phase of the mission, but nobody's in it now. Then it's got two methane oxygen chemical propulsion stages here, which, however, are unfueled. They gotta be unfueled, or this thing would weigh four times as much as it does, be much too heavy for anything like an Aries to throw to Mars. However, in some of the lower stage tanks that are later gonna contain methane, we have around six tons of liquid hydrogen, probably in gel form. And then slung below the vehicle, not shown in this picture, we have a little light truck, like a little pickup truck, runs on a methane oxygen internal combustion engine, and sitting in the back of the truck, we got a little nuclear reactor with a power of 100 kilowatts. Okay, so this is not a huge, you know, nuclear power plant like, you know, Diablo Canyon or Fort St. Francis. It's just a little cut cut thing we sit in the back of the truck. And the, after you land, the truck is telerobotically driven a few hundred yards away from the landing site, unwinding a cable off the back of it as it goes. You gotta drive slow because of the radio time lapse signal that you earthed at Mars, but it's not big wheels and you're not going very far. And then when you get a certain distance away, they lower the reactor off the truck, preferably in some crater or ditch, or just on the reverse side of the hill, anything to put a nice size chunk of dirt between the reactor and the main landing area. Then you turn the reactor on, and now you've got power to ship. What you do then is you run a pump, and you suck in Martian air, which is basically carbon dioxide gas. Okay, see, this is the whole point. Okay, Mars got an atmosphere made of CO2. It's the ideal feedstock for making rocket fuel. Shipping rocket fuel to Mars is like shipping oil to Saudi Arabia. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, uh, crazy. Okay. So, what do you do? You take your hydrogen, you react it with the CO2, it turns into methane and water. This is ancient uh, chemical engineering, the gaslight era. Uh, okay. The methane you store in your tank, that's natural gas, that's great rocket fuel. The water you take, you electrolyze it to hydrogen and oxygen. The oxygen you store in your other tank, that's the oxidizer to burn the methane with. The hydrogen is recycled to make more methane and water and so on. And then to make additional oxygen, which you want, you run a third reactor in which you just take the CO2 and you split it into carbon monoxide and oxygen. The oxygen you store, you use to oxidize the carbon monoxide you vent as waste. You can do that on Mars. There is no EPA there. <laughs> so, when, when all is said and done, what you manage to do here is you take your six tons of hydrogen, you turn it into 108 tons of methane oxygen by propellant on the surface of Mars. Okay? That's a leverage of 18 to 1. Okay? It's like a pioneer being able to acquire the useful mass of a bison for the transporting mass of several bullets and cartridges. And that's what makes the whole mission sing. 95% of your return propellant is coming from Mars. And because we can make so much propellant, we make extra propellant. Okay, which uh, can be used not only to power the Earth return vehicle, but to power ground vehicles using combustion engines. And we want to do that, okay, because there's no point going to Mars unless you can do something useful when you get there. The key thing to do something useful when you get there is to be able to explore. You need mobility for that, and combustion-powered vehicles have a big edge over battery-powered vehicles. That's why they're so much preferred on Earth, okay, and in a frontier environment like Mars, where you really do need the capability to provide combustion vehicles instead of battery-powered dog carts. You definitely want to have that, but you're not going to have that unless you can make your fuel there because it's just out of sight to try to transport it from uh, Earth. Okay? Now, a lot of times it's, it's easy to write chemical equations like this on, on a chart or something else to make it work in practice. That's not the case here. Uh, I built several machines of different types that do that and related types of chemical synthesis. This is the first one we built at Martin Marietta in 1993. This one you're looking at here is full scale for the Mars sample return mission. Okay, you know, it's not for this mission, but for a robotic sample return. And this system, which weighed uh, about 20 kilograms, uh, could produce 500 kilograms of propellant to support a sample return. Uh, and I might add that this thing was built in three months at Martin Marietta at a cost of $47,000. Now, you know, in the real world, I, I live in the real world like you, I mean, I go to the grocery store, all that kind of stuff. Okay, I know that in the real world, $47,000 can buy some cool stuff, all right? But in a major aerospace company, $47,000 $47, is, is it's nothing, okay? It's still it's not a beach of okay? It's, it's not there, okay? And, <laughs> I mean, this is the cheapest thing that was ever built at Martin Marietta. <laughs> uh, and it worked like a charm. And, uh, and I say that not to try to, to, to tell you I'm a great chemical engineer, because I'm not even a chemical engineer at all. Uh, so the fact that Anita was here, 
Uh, and uh, the fact that we can make this work just fine uh, proves that, that this is easy to take. That's what it proves to um, And it's, uh, this is the only part of the human Mars mission that you can do at home. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Alright, so now, it took uh, 8 months of this to fly to Mars, 10 months to make the propellant, that's 18 months. There's 26 months between launch windows from Earth to Mars. So, long before the next launch window has opened up, we will know that there's a fully fueled Earth return vehicle waiting for us on the surface of Mars. Okay, that being the case, at the next launch window, 2007, October 2007, mark your calendars, um, we launched two more of these boosters off the Cape. One shoots out another Earth return vehicle, fuel factory deal, the other shoots out a habitat with a crew of four astronauts in. Now, because our return ride is waiting for us on the surface of Mars, we do not need to fly to Mars in a Death Star spaceship. We don't even need to fly to Mars in the Millennium Falcon. We can fly to Mars in a tuna can. <laughs> That's very good, because we know how to build tuna cans, and they've been proven in commerce to be an extremely efficient shape for volumetric packaging purposes. Uh, and of course, our model is a little bigger than the standard chicken and the sea model. Uh, this one is 27 feet diameter, 16 feet tall, so it's got one scan, two decks, each with eight feet of headroom. The upper deck is where people live, the lower deck is sort of a cargo hold garage, a workshop kind of place. Here is the um, upper deck of the cab. Uh, what you can see, you've got a little state room for each of the four astronauts, uh, a science area, an exercise area, a galley. In the center is a solar flare storm shelter. Okay, and it's shielded with provisions. Okay, there's two kinds of radiation that can get you into planetary space. Solar flares, cosmic rays, they're different. Okay, solar flares come from the sun, obviously. Okay, the uh, there are events that occur, a big one can occur maybe once a year, although you might have two big ones in the same month and nothing much for two years. They're unpredictable. They can deliver thousands of rams to an unshielded astronaut, which is enough to kill, either immediately or after a relatively brief period of radiation sickness. That is bad. Okay. The good news, however, is that the kind of radiation that they are is just protons with energies of like a million volts, and those can be stopped by five inches of water or things that from the nuclear point of view are basically the same thing as water, i.e. food, or things that water and food become as the mission proceeds. And, <laughs> and we have enough of that on board the ship, pack it in around a central area to completely mask out solar flares. So what happens is solar flare happens, the alarm bell rings, everybody goes in here or packed in there, like passengers on the A train in Manhattan for about four hours, except you probably don't have hand handlers coming through. Uh, that's a different problem. The, uh, okay. Anyway, stay in there until you walk here, rings, you come out, you're safe, it's fine, you're done. It's going to happen once, twice, at most three times in the whole mission. That's, all, that's how you stay against solar flares. Now, cosmic rays are different. Okay? Cosmic rays don't come from the sun. In fact, nobody really knows where they do come from. They come from outside the solar system, and they're particles that come to zip it in from interstellar space with energies not of millions of volts per particle, but billions of volts. Three orders of magnitude more energy particle for particle than solar flare particles. So you can't stop them with five inches of water. You need more like five meters of water to stop the cosmic rays. Okay? And we can't afford that kind of mass, not even on a limited part of the ship. And it wouldn't even do any good to have it on a limited part of the ship because they don't come down and then in a big rush. They come all the time. It's a constant pitter patter of very high energy radiation coming in on you. Okay? Well, gee, so you're going to take the dose. That's bad. Okay? But the good news is that the magnitude of the dose just isn't that big. It's only around 50 rem for every year you're in interplanetary space in the Earth-Mars portion of the solar system. Because, and that's what we're going to be on this mission. We're going to be six months out, six months back, a year and a half on the surface. While you're on the surface, you can shield yourself a lot better. So if your dose is really long, you're in transit. Okay, what's 50 rem? What does that mean? Well, there's no prompt effects from 50 rem over a year. Okay, what there is is an estimated a statistical increase in, in, in possible risk of death by cancer at some point later in your life of around 1%. Okay? Now you gotta understand something. If you do not smoke right now, you have about a 20% chance that you're gonna die of cancer. This would make it 21. Okay? An average American smoker has a 40% chance of dying of cancer. So if we recruited the crew out of smokers <laughs> without their tobacco, you would be reducing their chance. <laughs> Before their health. <laughs> now, the other thing to 
notice here is we got some uh, um, we got uh, things on the floor like tables and chairs and shelves and sink. This thing is designed for use in a gravity environment, okay? And we can uh, land this on Mars. We're going to use it as our house on Mars. And there's gravity there, and on the way to Mars, we can make gravity by uh, tethering off the burnt out upper stage of the moose that threw us to Mars. And you tether off, by the way, you know, this, the question was brought up in the transam section about how you can make artificial gravity with a transam. This work just fine for that. Uh, although what's depicted here is a rigid aluminum module is just as easily be inflatable in that it would be bigger and nicer if it was. Uh, but this is designed for the inflatable people uh, demonstrated that they could do it. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, you tether off the burnt out upper stage of the booster. It's also flying to Mars. It's a counterweight on the end of the tether. You spin this up with one arm at the end. You got Mars normal gravity in the half. And the purpose of that is to avoid the extremely deleterious effects of long duration exposure to zero gravity that were observed on the Russian cosmonauts on the Mir and its predecessor Soviet space stations in the 1990s and 80s. Uh, and you know, according to the Russians, you know, they, whenever they'd spent six months on the Mir, they'd come land, they'd have to be hauled off in stretchers, and they said nothing worked, exercise didn't work, nothing worked. Okay. Well, I think this is still the right answer, but it, it should be said that we do have a new data point since this mission was designed. And that new data point is uh, Shannon Lucy. Okay. Shannon Lucy is right here. She's an American astronaut. Uh, now, Shannon Lucy spent six months on board the Mir in 1996. And then when she landed, she walked off the shuttle. Okay? And here she is walking around Johnson Space Center, you know, humid, putrid Johnson Space Center. Okay? <laughs> one day after she landed, this picture is in Newsweek, it was taken one day after she landed, she's walking around and she's shaking hands with. Bill Clinton, and she is still not sick. <laughs> How's that possible? <laughs> the, uh, well, uh, reason why it's possible is because Shannon actually did the exercises that were designed by the flight surgeons to JSC, which involved like two hours of hard exercises every day. And in consequence, when she landed, she was actually in better athletic condition than when she took off. Um, so she never worked out like that before in her life. So what she proved uh, is that if you do have people that self-disciplined, iron women, okay, you can in fact go to Mars and spend six months in zero G and land in acceptable condition. But if we want to also be able to send men to Mars, um, <laughs> uh, I mean, artificial gravity is, is a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Probably the women could be convinced to go along with it too. Uh, so, uh, here we are. Okay, they fly out to Mars, they fire a pyro bolt that cuts the tether, they arrow break in the Mars orbit, they land at site number one where the fully fueled Earth return vehicle is waiting for them. Okay, now we've been on the ground robotically speaking at site number one for two years. We thoroughly explored the area with little robotic rovers, kind of like little sojourn or maybe a little bigger, photographing everything that's used to do to train the crew with this landing. We've got a radar being on the ground to draw it in. We've got a base line on this thing. Pow, we should be able to land right on the spot. we are there. But let's say we screw up. Let's say we land 10, 20, 30 miles away. These would be big landing areas. We're still okay because we have with us in the lower deck of the half a pressurized ground roving vehicle about the size of a 4x4. Four four. It has a one way driving range of 600 miles. Okay, so it would really take piss poor pilots to bring this back to that vehicle. But let's say that happens. Let's say they land over. Now, not on the bridge, but, uh, uh, They land on the wrong side of Mars. Uh, okay, we're still okay because we've got the second Earth return following us out to Mars. And if we land on the wrong side of the planet, we can bring that one down to land near us wherever we did land. And that one would be done accurately because it would be uh, automated. Uh, <laughs> now, in that case, we depend on the chemical synthesis gear to work real time instead of back time. But the success of the technology has already been proven by the success of the first lander. And we do have a human crew on the scene to adjust the gear should it malfunction. Of course, we're probably dealing with the pilot and the development. Uh, but, the, uh, but it's okay. And then finally, as a fourth level backup, we got the whole crew on Mars where they got natural gravity, where they got substantial radiation protection offered by the Martian uh, environment, and uh, they got enough supplies with them to last for three years. So that if everything fails, they just come it out on the surface of Mars until the next launch window opens up, and more supplies than another <coughs> vehicle could be fired out to them at that time. 
So what you got here is a four-layer defense in depth on the mission. Each layer involves successfully carrying off the mission. Got multiple backup on the habitat with the two cameras and Earth return vehicle. Got two different Earth return vehicles to take you home. You're okay. Okay, but if the thing works as it's supposed to, you land at site number one, you use this vehicle for your return, and you land the other Earth return vehicle at site number two, okay, where it starts making propellant that'll be used to support the next return uh, mission, which flies out there in 2009, along with another Earth return vehicle, which is their backup, which otherwise opens up site number three. So the idea here is every two years you launch two boosters off the cape. One to open up a new site, one to exploit the previous site. Two boosters every two years is an average of one per year to support a continuous program of human exploration of Mars. We currently launch shuttles at a rate of around seven a year. So what we're talking about here is using 14% of our available heavy lift capability to support a program like this. That is something this country can easily afford to do. This is an actual photograph of the Mars base. <laughs> Uh, here's your return vehicle, there's the pumps for the fuel maker, which is in the landing stage, which acts as the takeoff pad for the rest of it. There's the reactor and the pre unit background. Here's the truly can have up the deck where you live, lower deck's the garage. There's a the pressurized ground rover, some photovoltaics, which are backup power in case you have to turn the reactor off. An inflatable greenhouse to use in, in experiments to learn how to grow crops on Mars. And a, um, this is the light truck that was used to deploy the reactor, which is now a backup car for the pressurized rover. You're going to be on Mars 500 days. Okay, year and a half. Okay, we, with the extra fuel that we make for this, we can drive it uh, 16,000 kilometers, which is 32 kilometers a day. Fair amount of exploration we can get done. Okay, and what are we going to explore for? We're going to try to explore Mars to try to find the answers to two fundamental sets of questions. We've got to have the answers to these questions. Okay, there's a lot of secondary questions. Okay, and all the scientists that are working on those are going to kill me for ignoring them. But, okay, to get right to the center of it, why it's important for humanity and not just academic scientists to explore Mars, there's two fundamental questions that have to be answered. The first, we revolve around the questions of was there, is there life on Mars? Okay, everybody here heard about the Allen Hills meteorite. Some of you may have heard uh, Everett Gibson's talk about it, about the evidence that has shown up in Martian meteorites for past life on Mars. That evidence is, is controversial, although I actually personally believe that their case is pretty strong. But even before that, that um, evidence surfaced, there was other, than other evidence making Mars a suspect uh, for life, uh, such as images of dry riverbeds all over the surface of Mars, dry lakes, and even now a dry up northern ocean. Mars was a warm and wet planet once. It was so for at least a billion years, a longer period of time than it took life to appear in the fossil record on Earth. <coughs> so if the theory is correct that life evolves wherever you have aqueous temperate environments for an adequate period of time, then life should have appeared on Mars. And if we can go to Mars and find incontroversial fossil evidence of life on Mars, let alone surviving life that might still exist in groundwater deep underground on Mars, okay, what you'll have proven is not just that Mars once had bugs. What you'll have proven is the processes that lead to the development of life are non-unique to the Earth, that they are general, that they are highly probable. And since we now know that planetary systems are highly probable, what that would mean is that life is essentially everywhere. And since the whole history of life on Earth is a history of development from simple forms to more complex forms, each involving greater degrees of capability, intelligence, uh, activity, and, and capability for further and more accelerated evolution, what that would say is that intelligent life is almost everywhere. If we find fossils of life on Mars, it means we're not alone. Okay? And that's worth finding out. Okay? But it's going to take human explorers on the planet to do that. I mean, you know, little robots are fine, they're cute, I love them, okay? I'd rather have them than nothing at all, don't get me wrong. But you could land a thousand sojourners in the Rocky Mountains, and you would never find a dinosaur fossil, okay? At least not until the next ice age came when your armies of sojourners would be crushed by the advancing glaciers, which they did not have one. The, uh, <laughs> but the, uh, you really got to get your rock hounds out there. Now, you're on the planet in a year and a half, end of that time, you get in the Earth return vehicle, put the key in the ignition, start it up, and uh, head back to Earth. Leave behind on Mars the habitat, the greenhouse, the cars, the reactors, all this stuff, okay, so that as the sequence of mission proceeds, okay, you have a series of worming huts scattered across Mars, and a new Texas is creating a... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, for scale, 
I'm sorry to inform this audience, but Mars is much bigger than in Texas. The, uh, 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 commission centered at the center of the circles to explore a region about the size of the great state of Texas. And the, uh, so you can see we're opening up territory to human cognizance on a, a pretty large scale, exploring fairly substantial regions. But after a series of these missions have occurred, and I don't know whether it's after eight or three or 15, but maybe it's eight, we'll have gotten the answer to question number one. We'll have known, we'll know whether there was ever life on Mars. We'll have a pretty good idea of how it managed to complexify and manifest itself. Okay? And at that point, the fundamental question about Mars is gonna to shift to question number two, which is the much more important question about Mars. And that question is not, was there or is there life on Mars? The most important question about Mars is, will there be life on Mars? Because the key thing you gotta know about Mars, the most important thing, the most important single fact you gotta know about Mars is this, is that Mars is not just an object of scientific inquiry. It is that, it's a very important object of scientific inquiry. It's the Rosetta Stone for knowing whether life is unique to the Earth or whether we're part of the general phenomena that pervades the universe, okay? But it's much more than that. It's a world, okay? It is a planet that has on it all the resources needed to support life and civilization, a planet with a surface area equal to all the continents of Earth put combined, okay? And it has water, enough water to cover the planet with an ocean 600 feet deep if it was melted out. Okay, it's got carbon, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, carbonates in the soil. It's got nitrogen in the atmosphere. Those are the four elements of life, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, uh, hydrogen. Okay, it's got the secondary elements of life, sulfur, phosphorus, calcium, all that. Okay, it's got the elements of industry, iron, titanium, aluminum, silicon, etc., etc. And it's had complex geological history of hydrologic and volcanic action that has led to the creation of mineral ore. Okay, you don't get that on the moon. Okay, and half these elements are absent from the moon, particularly carbon, nitrogen, and hydrogen for the most part. Okay, so Mars is a place that we can settle. And if we can go to Mars and establish a permanent Mars base by picking out in this period of prior exploration the most favorable location for it, and just starting to land and a whole bunch of halves all in the same place, we can establish an engineering on base on Mars, okay, to develop the craft of using these resources on Mars. And if we can do that, we can make Mars habitable. Now what do I mean by make Mars habitable? <clears throat> do I mean that we can terraform Mars, transform it into another Earth, complete with a full living biosphere of plants and animals and birds flying from tree to tree, back much easier than they can on Earth because of lower gravity? Uh, well, in the long run, yeah. In the long run, I do believe that humans will terraform Mars because it is the nature of life to take barren environments and transform them into those that are fertile for the development and propagation of life. That is the whole history of life on Earth. Okay, that's how life transformed the Earth's atmosphere, transformed the continents, populated the mountains with trees, which have formed habitats, et cetera, one thing after another. Okay, and uh, it would essentially be unnatural if humans, who are the mechanism that the biosphere has evolved that allows it to leap across interplanetary space and establish itself on other worlds, did not do precisely that when offered the opportunity. So we're going to do it, or the human race is going to do it, but we're not going to do it. Because that is for the future. Okay, that is beyond our generation, the full transformation of Mars. But nevertheless, we can make Mars habitable by transforming it intellectually. Because the thing that determines whether an environment is habitable or not is only partly its intrinsic resources. It's really largely the function of what you got up here, okay? And in, in other words, you know, two people can be stranded in the woods and one can starve to death in three weeks and the other can live there indefinitely in relative comfort. Why? Because to one, the resources of the woods are invisible and to the other, they are apparent. Okay? Well, it's the same with Mars. If you can go to Mars and learn the craft of Mars, if you can learn how to take um, uh, water out of Martian soils, learn how to grow crops in Martian greenhouses, learn how to extract geothermally heated water from the deep subsurface, which will give us lots of water and even power. If we can learn how to make bricks on Mars, ceramics, glasses, plastics, metals, wires, tubes, habitation structures, if we can build that craft of self-sufficiency on Mars, then we can turn Mars into a place that humans can settle, then we can open up a new world for humanity. Now, I, I'm not going to go into it at any length because it's talking itself, uh, but I don't believe the moon is a stepping stone to Mars, but I do believe that the moon is a destination of interest for other reasons, most notably for you, incredible astronomy to explore the universe from, and it makes a lot of sense 
if you're developing hardware to explore Mars that you have, that haven't become so it could also be used to enable human activities on the moon. And without explaining how, I'll just tell you uh, that in Mars Red Plan, you can the same piece of hardware can be used to support the development of the lunar base. You want to know the full details? It's all in my book, by the way. It should be on sale in the back of the room in the talk. 13 bucks, you buy it, I'll sign it. It's a win win situation. But, uh, <laughs> so, that. Okay, this is the full set of tools, or a primary tools anyway, that we need to establish humanity on two new worlds in the next decade. No giant interplanetary spaceships, no floating interplanetary spaceports. Just a good booster and a good throw stage, okay, and then two primary pieces of flight hardware. A HAB module, you can use on either the moon or Mars, although you've got to insulate it differently because it's a different thermal environment, okay, and an Earth return vehicle for coming back from the moon or Mars. The Mars one requires two stages to come back, the moon only one, because the delta V to come back from the moon is three kilometers a second, and from Mars it's six, okay, so. They're three each, okay? Um, and, uh, and an aerobrake module they use on Mars. You wouldn't want to use an aerobrake uh, module uh, on the moon uh, unless it was made in a politically significant district. Uh, uh, but this is it. Now, this is not a $400 billion program you're looking at here. In my estimation, this is around a $20 billion program that's done in traditional ways. Uh, to uh, develop all this hardware, and then each Mars mission by the copy would probably cost around two billion, and each lunar mission around one. So if we had a 20-year program where the first 10 years we're developing all this stuff, and in the second 10 years we're flying 10 missions to the moon and five to Mars, dropping $40 billion over 20 years is two billion a year. It's 15% of NASA's budget. It's less than 1% of the US military budget. It, it, you know, it's 25 cents a week for every American, okay? Right now, we're spending, uh, two cents a week for every American on Mars exploration in the robotic exploration program that we have. If we made that the princely stuff of a quarter a week, we could have humans on Mars in 10 years, okay? Now, we have to, as I said at the beginning of this talk, we've got to seize the time, okay? It is for that reason that we had the founding convention of the Mars Society uh, in uh, Boulder last summer. We had 700 people there, the people may have heard about this, it was incredible. Uh, conference that started the Mars Society. We're going to have another conference there this August. You can get the details on our website. It's August 12th through 15th. But if you want to be part of this movement, you might want to come to this event. We started this society, um, and we have uh, three major lines of activity. One is broad public outreach to spread the vision of, of pioneering Mars to the population at large. The second is political work to fight for a Mars program and Mars programs. And the third is private projects of our own. Um, our first private project that we have launched is to develop a uh, simulated human Mars exploration base in the Canadian Arctic on Devon Island. Devon Island is a polar desert with a meteor impact crater there that's created geology very similar to Mars. Okay, we are going to build a uh, prototype Mars habitat defining laboratory uh, habitation and workshop functions and use them to support the exploration of this area uh, and learn how to conduct operations in a Mars-like environment. It's both going to be a test bed for equipment, but even more so for operational procedures in order to learn how people can really operate on Mars and conduct combined human robot uh, field research operations. We're also doing, as I said, political work. Okay, We're having our chapters going out, meeting with congressmen. We want to meet with all the political players grouped around the candidates, talking about the necessity of the human Mars program. Okay, Right now, we're in a battle to save Transham. Uh, people here heard the talk about the Transnap in the previous session. This is an incredible program. With $3 million they've developed a technology that's going to cut in half the weight of a, of a Mars habitat. It's going to save billions of dollars off the cost of human Mars missions and moon missions and asteroid missions and Earth orbital development and all of that. Okay? And yet, uh, Congressman Rohrabacher has stuck le uh, language in the um, NASA authorization bill that uh, would kill the Transat program outright, okay? And in answer to an inquiry as to why they were doing this, Jim Muncy, his aide who wrote the Transat killing language, uh, gave the following response. He said, tell Bob Zuber that I'm thinking of recommending tightening the provision just because Transat is really just about humans to Mars. And Chairman Rohrabacher hates humans to Mars, okay? This, you need to know this. You need to know who your friends are and who they are not. Okay? The, uh, now, this is outrageous. We can't let this happen. 
This is a, a major uh, uh, step forward in uh, space technology that is being killed precisely in order to make humans to Mars more expensive and thus make it less likely politically. Now, the House has passed this bill with the anti-trans half language in it. The Senate, however, passed the NAFTA authorization bill without the anti-trans half language in it. The two bills need to be reconciled. Okay? The two key players are Senator McCain from the Senate and Sensenbrenner, head of the Science Committee from the House. Okay? If you want to save that program, you need to do something. And I don't care whether you're a member of the Mars Society or the NSS or nothing at all. Okay? You need to contact them okay, and send letters or phone calls or even emails to the offices of McCain and Sensenbrenner and says, delete the anti-trans have language from the NAFTA authorization bill. Okay? You need to do that. And the other thing you need to do, especially, I mean, a lot of people here are from Texas, okay? You got a congressman from very near here who's kind of a powerhouse, okay? It's Tom DeLay, okay? You need to contact Tom DeLay and tell him to take Rohrabacher and Muncie to the woodshed. <laughs> and tell him, don't mess with Texas. We, uh, because we can't have this. We can't have people thinking that a couple of individuals think that they can stop the United States and humanity from opening a new world. So I'm going to conclude with a quote. Okay? This is a quote that I pulled from a book by William Bradford. Bradford was the leader of the Pilgrims, and he wrote this book in 1621, one year after the Mayflower landing. And what he's talking about here is uh, the history of the pilgrims and the debate that erupted among them when they were in Holland. And they didn't like what was happening to them there, and they didn't know what to do about it. And um, what happened was one guy came up with a totally incredible suggestion that what they ought to do about it was relocate the entire congregation from the civilized Netherlands into the wilds of North America. Because there, okay, however difficult it might be, there they could cut their own path. There they could make their own world. And he says the following, this proposition, relocation to America, being made public and coming to the scanning wall, erased many variable opinions amongst men and caused many fears and doubts amongst themselves. Some, from their reasons and hopes conceived, labored to stir up and encourage the rest to undertake and prosecute the same. Others, again, out of their fears, objected against it and sought to divert from it. It led you many things, and those neither unreasonable nor unprobable, as that it was a great design and subject to many unconceivable perils and dangers. It was answered that all great and honorable actions are accompanied with great difficulties and must be both enterprised and overcome with answerable courages. Now, I put that up there because you've got to understand something. Everyone, a lot of you understand it, but we've got to recall it. Okay, that it was that and nothing less than that was the kind of sheer moxie that it took to establish European civilization in North America in the first place. And that and nothing less than that is going to be what is required to establish humanity on Mars. Because look, I just showed you this plan. And despite the fact that it is by far the cheapest Mars mission plan that has ever been seriously proposed, I believe it's also the safest. It's the safest because the relatively small vessels can be completely integrated on the ground at the Cape where you have much more quality control than you could ever have in construction on orbit of mega spacecraft. And you've got two complete Earth return vehicles to take you home. And you've got a four layer defense in depth on the mission of backup plans. So you've got an artificial gravity and a solar flare shelter and ways to make oxygen on Mars to back up your closed plant support. And one thing and another, you've got all this stuff. But nevertheless, it's going to be risky. Okay? It's going to be risky when people go to Mars the first time. That is a fact. And that is going to be a fact whether we do it my way in 2007 or whether we just abdicate our historical responsibility altogether and leave to some far future civilization to do it 3007. But if you look at human history, and I don't care when you look, whether you're looking at 1621 or 1944 or 1969 or any other time, one thing is perfectly clear. And that is that nothing great has ever been accomplished without courage. Thank you.